Um, I'm going to bounce off the wall, uh, sort of, on daily chore routine um, and give you a, odds, a lot of odds and ends to think about. Len, we're going to start, though, slightly different. Before we even start to talk about chore routine, I'm going to give you two or three tips in your barn that make life easier. Things that I've run across in the country out there. And tip number one, I ran into this in a producer's barn in Marshalltown, Iowa. Um, a lot of you now have rooms or you know entry points into your facilities that got the controllers and refrigerator and whatever. That's a dollar calculator Velcroed to the wall. Okay, and I've been bugging all the feed companies in Lanco and everyone. Instead of it saying staples, it should say whatever product you're promoting. Now, this is important for us old farts. You young kids in the audience know how to use the calculator on this phone. I don't. I like this kind of calculator yet. Right? And you're standing in the barn. So, just Velcro sticky tape stuck to the wall. Um, one tip. Second one, and I actually ran into this again last week in a situation. How many of you have built production facilities and you are always going to get a shell, set of shelves in there someday to hold everything? <laughs> right? And I walk in the barn and the drugs are lined up on the floor and there's a needle over here and a box that's wet somewhere else. Best I've seen consist, whoops, consistently a lot of you have an electric panel that looks like this. Why not just put a little shelf right under it? Because many of you are using your controllers for day high, high, low, and you're asked by the production system if you're growing pigs for someone, log the daily high, low for me, and you got sheets you got to keep. Why not put a little shelf in there? Something like that. Um, key to this shelf is right there, the rounded edge. It pokes me in my belly if the edge isn't round, and it hurts. Okay, so be sure you round the edge. The other one, um, and I, this is where I come in a lot of times when I'm when I'm asked to walk facilities and and you know assess ventilation or whatever. You get out there and you say, well, what is the brand of fan? And maybe we can figure that out. What's the model? I have no clue. Um, gee, I just know I bought it from so and so. Um, what do you do with all the owner's manuals? So you see them, typically the controller manual is stuck above, and that's fine until you happen to power wash, and then you peel the pages apart and hope the ink goes with the right page. Or they're laying on the floor, and you go peel them apart in the mouse droppings, right? Why not just a Rubbermaid tub for some of those manuals you want to keep in the barn? Pretty simple and, and very effective for that. So it has nothing to do with chores, but it has everything making your life easier. So let's start talking. Oh, I don't know. Can you mess with the lights and see if we can get this front turned down? Probably lower number is better. Nope, that's going up. Higher number is better then. Okay, it's one way or the other. Um... <laughs> Yeah, because because you can't see what this is. One of the you know issues to think about in daily chore routine as he thinks about that is what are you doing as part of the biosecurity at the site? How many of you, and none of you in this room would do it because you're all better pork producers than average. How does the average pork producer do chores? Drives up in a sloppy pickup, swings the door open, runs in to check something, right? doesn't worry about boots and shoes, maybe has been to town, and it's the same pickup, and he stopped at Casey's on the way to get his Mountain Dew. Number one circulation point for PERS virus by foot traffic is what? Casey's. Every hog barn employee stops at Casey's, don't they? In your, or come and go, or quick trip, right? So, so, do you have in your barn an entry point to change boots and quit tracking out from your pickup? Doesn't need to be fancy, but what have you done to not be the vector bringing it into the barn? Um, I've been in some facilities already, all they paint is a white line. When you go across the white line, you've got to be out of your street shoes. 
Okay, and it can be fancier than that. But the idea of have you created in your chore routine a clean and a dirty line? We talk about it a lot with filtered sow units and stuff. We need to be talking about it for grow finish barns and, and nurseries too. Chores are, are two aspects, animal care and facility care. Unfortunately, I end up in many barns, in, and this has been a function of our changing industry, um, have been in a lot of barns, in northern Iowa especially, and we're getting more of them built now, where a crop farmer builds the barn because he wants the manure. Hires a management company to run the pigs, and the management company has the labor, and I walk the barn three months in a row, and the same piece of equipment's broken. So you ask the chore person, how come it isn't fixed? And they said, I was hired to take care of pigs, not to be a welder. And you talk to the crop farmer, and the crop farmer says, I built the barn, and I told you when I built the barn, I was never going to go in it, because hogs stink, but I want the manure. Okay? Facility care is part, someone has to assume that responsibility, and it becomes part of chores, as we'll see. The daily list is, is long. And, and we've all thought about that, but let's talk about the mistakes that get made in the daily list and how you might apply them. And we're going to start with the obvious reason you do chores, right? Because you got to make sure there's feed in all the feeders. Um, and that's surprising how often that doesn't happen. You've all been aware of that one. You pull up to a site, and then if, if the auger didn't time out, what's it doing? Going clack, 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 right? Or whatever. So let's think about chores and, and that. This is an interesting number. We're going to do a feed of $225 a ton. It may be more, it may be less, depending on what you did for corn, but we're in that range. On a finishing barn, 2.7 turns, we're putting that kind of gain on. If you've got a 50-wide barn, there's 66 pigs eating out of every feeder, right? That's how much feed goes through every feeder in the barn. This is a big number that you manage when you make a feeder adjustment. You don't think about it that way, do you? You're out there adjusting feeders sometimes and doing it. 57 ton of feed a year go through a barn. On a 40 wide, it's 45 ton. Because you got fewer pigs on a feeder. Big number. So the point here is, if you've been at some other sessions I've been doing lately, it, I'm down the road there's going to be a lot of talk about replacing feeders. Because if I replace feeders and I gain that difference in feed conversion because I replace feeders, that's what I get every year for every feeder. <laughs> it's a big number. And big numbers get bigger. So a thought process as we think about feeders, we've all talked about adjusting feeders. The real world is we still got lots of feeders that are messed up. So I started dating pictures I take in barns and of feeders that aren't right and how to waste feed. Okay? Oh, I got some good ones in here. <laughs> okay? Yeah. <laughs> this is the real world of pork production. Yeah, it gets you thinking about what can happen. Or this. We have some of you who are so insistent, I'm not going to waste feed. I was in a barn one, this is out in Ohio. Every feeder was that tight in the barn. There is no feed waste, because there is no feed eating. <laughs> right? It, it is a real issue. So, what do we say? We, you've heard the numbers and others have talked about it. 40 to 50 percent pan coverage versus the old rule of 25 to 30. The best way, and, and that's a big discussion point, you tell an employee or your teenage son or whoever, 40 to 50 percent pan coverage doesn't mean anything. Best way to get your feeders adjusted consistently is when you're in the barn with whoever else is doing chores with you and responsible for adjusting feeders, a camera. Take a picture of the feeder you agree is right and put that picture in the barn. Now the discussion is, is the, does the feeder look like the picture? There isn't my definition of 40% versus your definition. Does it look like the feeder? My experience is when we've done that at grower sites, 
we get much better consistency of feeder adjustment. Does Yes or no, does it look like the feeder? Makes this discussion simple. Like the picture, makes it really simple. There it is, take a picture. Absolutely the, the simplest thing you can do to improve feeder adjustment. The second issue, because it's feed, water, and air, right? That's the three things we're going to talk about. So we got feed out of the way, let's move to water. Um, and, and water, we're going to do a little different. We know the type of drinker affects the daily water needs with nipples wasting much more water than cups. The one thing we don't think about when we're walking barns is this. And again, this isn't showing up. Leaking drinkers. Uh, it isn't leaking too bad, I can wait one more day. Right? I'm in a hurry. So we, I got a couple of years ago, I got in a discussion with a production system. So I went home, this is my kitchen sink. I went home, and that's my kitchen sink drinking. That's the tube we use to feed my daughter with. So I set my kitchen sink, so it's 15 drips for every 10 seconds. So those of you that are in music, that's a beat of 90. Drip, 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 drip. That ain't very fast compared to what I see. That, if you do the math out, is seven and a half gallons a day. Costs you a penny and a quarter a gallon to haul that manure to the field, that's a dime a day. Leaking drinkers suddenly add up big time, don't they, if I start saying a dime a day. And in manure disposal costs. And you, I can take you to barns where the drinkers have leaked since day one and it isn't a big deal. I want my manure wagon to be full of shit, manure with value, N, P, and K, not water going drip, drip, drip. I want the water that's in the pit to go through the pig on the way to the pit. So there, you can think a dime a day for a leaking drinker. <laughs> or more. The other one, you, we've done, we've talked about it here and elsewhere, is the idea of a first symptom of a sick pig, they quit drinking. Right? Many of you are doing this now, logging daily water use by a variety of ways. This is, is a graph of a set of pigs. This is water. The red line is 24 hour water use. This is 24 hour feed deliveries. When pigs get sick, they don't drink. That's swine flu influenza right there. Um, or here's another swine influenza break. The idea of logging, what I see in a lot of barns, it's, it's a calendar and you write the water meter reading down once a day. Um, and that's nice except the number gets real big and there's five zeros after a while. And you don't have to do it. If you want something quick and dirty, um, this website is still functioning at the University of Nebraska, porkcentral.unl.edu. And the lower left on that web page is an Excel spreadsheet to create a barn chart for water. Okay, so that you put the water meter reading in and you graph it. So there's swine influenza. Can you see when the pigs got sick? Rule of thumb on water, three days down. The third day water disappearance goes down, you'd better be looking at pigs. Those of you that, you know, are good at chores already, a lot of you by day two, you notice it already. But a lot of our employees and, and new people that haven't raised pigs, putting in contract barns, three days down. Third day, you'd look at pigs, or a sudden 30% change. Um, real handy. Let me go back. The other one that's out there is we're starting to see, this is DICAM USA, one of the companies that sells data capture. We're starting to see other systems out there that capture water patterns. IBOX or ABOX from AP is another one, um, and others. Every night it should go to zero, because if it doesn't go to zero for an hour at night, from usually between one and three at night, water should go to zero and nurseries and grow finish. Because what? All the pigs are sleeping. If it doesn't go to zero, what do you got going on in the barn? Drinkers that are leaking. And you ought to see some of these barns that I get data from, how bad they leak. And what, what's really good on that one is that's where you find the drinker with the broken spring that when you walk the barn it happens to reset, right? And not be leaking. <laughs> and as you can notice that. So, 
So there's, there's a, a look at that one. But the other clue, whether you use my spreadsheet or others, if you're going to write down and log daily water using water meters, start logging from the bottom to the top of the sheet. Because every day water's meter reading is higher than the day before. So when you're, if you're math challenged like me, you can do the math. The big number's on top for subtraction. <laughs> okay? So, so a quick and dirty clue there. The other challenge with water is not that we need a gallon and a half a day, is what do we need to have in the water line for feeding the pig at 10 o'clock in the morning? And, and this is the drinking behaviors of pigs. The red dash line is summer heat. The solid line is winter thermal neutral conditions. Data from England on when pigs eat in thermal neutral. It looks just like that line. Data from Harold Gagno in Canada in summer heat. Looks like that line. Peak drinking demand in the barn in thermal neutral is mid-afternoon. But when we get to summer heat, it's very first thing in the morning and late in the evening. And those drinking demands can be pretty high. So you start saying, this is gallons of water per 15 minute interval. In this barn, it was a 12, uh, 1600. But you start saying, I gotta get 45 gallons in 15 minutes. I gotta get three gallon a minute flow, absolutely, don't I? Right? So can your water line deliver three gallons a minute? How big a water line does it take to deliver three gallons a minute? That you don't know. I didn't know either. So I started did the math. I said, you know, all of you, I would bet, without ever walking in your barn, I've only been in one recently that wasn't, is a three quarter inch PVC on the ceiling. Goes the length of the barn. I was in one the other day that was half inch. Three quarter inch inside diameter PVC. Pi R squared. Um, four feet per second is the velocity that you design for in piping with schedule 40. If you go to five feet per second, you gotta go to schedule 80 because of the pressures. So four feet per second, you do all the math. Three quarter inch pipe nominally can deliver five and a half gallons a minute. Okay, and here's the other sizes. Well, why is that important? So we start plumbing medicators with things like washing machine hoses that are half inch, that are three eighths inch. Look what they do to flow. It's a really big number in terms of flow. So you got sick pigs in the barn and you're going to treat them. Well, number one, do you adjust nipples? I, I just put this in the idea. I'm still walking off a lot of barns if they're using nipples, but that's as high as the bracket can go on the gate. I guarantee every pig's going to have a shoulder bruise. That's not a good deal. Um, and, and what's involved there, but that's part of it. The other challenge we face on water, in addition to water line sizing, is the impact of pressure. Many of you have pressure reducers. Almost all of you now have pressure reducers in the barn. Okay? And, and if you've certified pesticide applicator, been through that test, you have to think about pressure, right? You're used to thinking about it with sprayer nozzles. It's really a big deal in hog barns. This is the formula for the impact of pressure. It's the square root of the ratio of pressures. So if your pressure tank on the farm is 40 and your pressure reducer in the barn is at 20, your flow is 70%. So now instead of 5.5 gallons per hour, I'm down to 4 gallon an hour. Because I I don't have as big a horsepower pushing it through. If I have Crystal Springs wet dry feeders, and Marv tells you you got to be at 5 PSI at the drinker, Three quarter inch line don't move much water. Because <laughs> the other thing that happens with water lines is for every hundred foot of run, you lose one pound of pressure. So you start getting these new barns that are 240, 260 foot long, and your wet dry feeder, does the back end have a chance to get water? So it's, it's a real concern. Not that the guy doing chores has to worry about it, but it, it is a concern there. Recommended pressures, again, the idea, this is what the equipment companies are all telling me. Crystal Springs wet-dry, they want 10 PSI max at the, at the 
feeder. Most drinkers are at 20, the bladders were at 40. So there's, there's some differences in flows associated with that. But let's talk sick pigs, because you're the chore person. That's why you're sitting here, how to do daily chores. So you, so you decide the pigs are sick. They got influenza, so you're going to put them on aspirin. You started a set of pigs, they got suis, so you're going to put Amox in the water or something. Have you figured out how your medicator works? Well, no, I just medicate and I know they'll drink it. And then the complaint always is what? Every time I medicate, my pigs don't drink the water. They must not like the medicine. Do they not like medicine or can't they get it? So let's talk about the medicator and the plumbing of the medicator because this is interesting. This is how I think medicator should be plumbed. This is off of a quad barn, but how medicator should be plumbed. The best way to plumb medicators is with unions directly in. So you have a hole. Because the medicators, all they tell you when you go out to the trade show, they're all going to sell you a medicator that can do seven gallon a minute. Right? And my three quarter inch water line is down to 5.5. And then I use, if I'm lucky, a five eighths inch hose on a hose bib, right? So while I took this picture many years ago at a site, thinking, man, this is good. But I, one day I was looking at it, so I follow this around. See how that hose is connected into the water line? With a barbed elbow. What's the inside diameter of the barbed elbow that you put a 5 8 inch hose over? <laughs> Under a half inch. So do the pigs not like the medicine, or can't they even get it? Brand new barn, there's 2,000 pigs drinking on this drinker. Right? How many of you have used washing machine hose to hook up a medicator? I'm going to say there's got to be a bunch of you. Because why did you do that? Because you know it ain't going to leak, right? It's crimped in and boy, it's handy. So think about it. Your medicator is rated at seven gallons a minute. Your water line's 5.5. Half inch washing machine hose is two and a half gallon a minute. <laughs> but the pigs don't like the medicine. That's why they don't drink it. Or this one. This is the best one I've got on, on this. This is a brand new barn in northwest Iowa. Uh, I was there about 10 days after pigs went in. So I was trying to figure out how much water they could really drink. So you're down to 20 PSI coming off a three quarter inch line. Your water meter is a five eighths inch meter. And by the way, that's your number one limit on water flow in a barn. Go home and look at your water meters. They all say five eighths on them. Because unless you spec it in the bid, that is what the builder put in. Because it's 40 to $50 more to go to a three quarter inch meter. Unless you spec it different, they're all gonna be five eighths inch meters on there. So you follow the meter. Big Gator Medicator, and this is interesting, these two water lines. Those were bought at Menards. And if you go to Menards and buy the colored washing machine lines, they're 3 eighths inch interior, inside diameter. 1.4 gallon a minute. <laughs> okay? Or this one. I got that kind of connection on the line. <laughs> Ain't going to work, is it? Here's the best one that I can show you of how not to plumb a medicator. And I stumbled on this by accident. I was at a site for something else, and this is where the medicator hangs on the wall, right? And when I'm there, they said the medicator's in town being repaired again. Every time we medicate, we have problems with the medicator. What brand should we buy? Yeah. So I started looking. He'd use the no braid, no burst, the metal braid, no burst hoses. Oh, notice there's a swivel right there. All the water has to go through that swivel. So that's the hose at the end of my hand. All the water for 1,200 pigs has to go through that itty bitty hole. But the medicator's the problem. Gets better. There's a tag hanging on the hose. The tag says, man, it will stop all flow at two and a half gallon a minute. <laughs> but the medicator is broke. Okay? Clear issue, isn't it? 
So thinking about when you're doing chores, can I get treat sick pigs in terms of doing it? Let's talk about the next one, doing chores. How many of you have sick, of course none of you in this room was, it's your neighbors and your brother-in-law that has this barn. Your sick pen is a dust collector. Right? You get ready to sell pigs out of a barn and there's two pens that look like this yet. You have severely compromised performance of all pigs in the barn because you've ended up overcrowding the barn and the other pens. Your goal is to keep stocking density in every pen equal and as low as possible. The, the more space, the faster they grow. Sick pens are not designed to be mad storage pens. Or sick pens aren't designed to be feed bag storage pens. They're designed for what? To put sick pigs in so they can brew. Does your sick pen look like this? Boy, these aren't coming out. Or like this. The, the idea I want to get across on sick pen is the sick pen in the barn should be the best environmental pen in the place, right? That's why you pull the pig. To give him an opportunity to be better because he wasn't doing good where he was. And usually he isn't doing good because he's running fever or whatever. So what do you guys all do? If you got a tunnel barn, where's the sick pen? Almost always in a tunnel barn. At the tunnel curtain, because that's where you drag the deads out. What's the coldest, most drafty pen in a tunnel barn? <laughs> By the curtain end. Uh, you know, you just guaranteed what, and, and yeah, I, I better be careful because this is on Swinecast, so I can't, I don't want the term out there of what sick pens really are for many of you. Tunnel barns, I want the sick pen at least 40 to 50 feet down. Two reasons. One, it's a better environment. Secondly, your tunnel barn many times is not on the site with a house, right? You deed it off five acres somewhere and the tunnel barn is. Anyone with a camera can come and take pictures. In the summer, especially tunnel curtain down. You want your best pigs presented in case someone is using you for evidence. You don't want the pen of cripples and the broken shoulder that you should have euthanized three weeks ago and all of that being the one in front. You got to get that sick pen down the barn. Do you use sick and graduate pens? Do you have a pen, a smaller pen to get them started for three to five days? If they don't recover, it's time to euthanize them because that's the right thing to do. Or, do, and then, or if they get better, they go to another pen. Have you thought about how to put that in your barn? Here's another trick. I, a couple weeks ago I ran in this one. Microweight pigs are heavier than hell to drag out of a barn. That's why you put the sick pen so close to the door. Many of you have tried various dead pig carts. And they work sometimes and sometimes not. This is the slickest I've seen. And this producer, um, his daughter that's in college, and I don't think she weighed 100 pounds, said she can pull dead pigs out of barns with this. This is just a sheet of white plastic, that recycled milk jug, slick stuff, cut to the width, and they roll. The new one he makes around it on the corner so they don't catch on the gate, and a rope and a piece of, of hose so your hand doesn't on nylon rope. And he says, now when you pull a pig out, you gotta have a, a snare on the leg so a pig doesn't catch on all the gates. But he says, you can pull a big pig because this slides so easy. And it's cheap to make. Because dead pig removal is, is part of daily chore routine. Do you post dead pigs? Or do you just drag them out and, if you're lucky, log them on a sheet for someone so inventory balances? Um, we don't expect any of you to have the skills of a veterinarian. That's not appropriate. But... Can you at least make a list like this? When the pigs die, the lungs were bad, or gee, the, the guts didn't look right, or I opened the stomach and there was an ulcer, or there was fibrin or something. Because over time, that builds a really fast history for your herd, long-term herd health. In the research barns that I'm associated with, SVC Research, we cut open every pig. 
And at the end, you know, just so we know what's going on. It doesn't take long once you get trained. But, but crudely, that's all we ask for is when you cut them. Give me some categories to work with. It mean worth a lot. What about euthanasia? None of us, because we care, remember we have the We Care program, we care, so it's hard for us to kill pigs, right? Best thing we can do is kill pigs, properly with euthanasia. Something like that, best thing was about 10 days ago. And when, do, when does it happen? Oh, gee, the barn's going to be empty and i got a dozen pigs, i got to go out and get the rifle and knock them down. They should have been euthanized as you went along. It's a real concern. If you've been through a swap assessment at your site, you get ranked on what percent of your deaths are euthanasia. With the idea of avoiding this in your barns. Chores also include management of the compost pile. This is how not to do it. This is not a catastrophic death loss. This is about three weeks of deads out of a finisher. Um, that'll get you in trouble real fast. Or even that one. So chores include more than pig, don't they? The idea of compost management, because most of you are composting your deads now. Next part. We've just spent all our life looking down at the pigs. Have you ever looked up when you did chores? Right? So let's talk about when you're in barns, do you think about is the right fan on? Or do you just run through and get chores done? And gee, if fan is on, it must be working right. Which fan should be on when you do chores? And if the furnace is running, is that the right appropriate? Or, or should you be asking when you're doing chores, why is that furnace running today? So we're going to take you through, I call it the owner's manual, and have done that before in this room, how a barn works. And we're going to model uh, a tunnel barn because it's simplest. So we've got all of you, if you've got grow finished barns, you've almost all got two 24-inch fans, stage one. Some of you, if, you're, if, if you've got um, Valco fans, you've got 220s on stage one. But 224 stage one looks like this. Assuming your controller set right, 1,200 pigs in a room, that's just under 5 CFM a pig, minimum ventilation. Okay? There's a spreadsheet. We're going to take a 50 by 190. This could look like any barn in the country. Two degree bandwidth on stage one. Warm up a degree, go to stage two, stage three, stage four. This is how your barns operate. This is an absolute. These, these can't change. This is the balance of heat in a barn. Heat production by the pig versus heat loss from your walls and the fans. What temperature is the room balanced? Incoming air equals loss. And minimum ventilation with those kinds of set point temperatures that's balance point. That's the line where the furnace should run. If the furnace is running on 100 pound pigs and it's 20 or 30 degrees, why? Right? Isn't that part of chores? So what you can do with this chart is you can go across and say, gee, my pigs are about 150 pounds and it's 40 degrees outside today. Well, stage two fan ought to be ramped up pretty good, but I shouldn't have the 36 coming on. If the 36 is coming on, why is it coming on? Etc. The other part that you have to think about and is many people, when you're setting your controllers, your thought process is, I, if I dial in 62 set point, the barn will be 62. That's an impossibility with the controllers we use. Because we said, this is what room temperatures are going to be down across the bottom, given these conditions. Because we said, don't make this fan run fast until the room is two degrees warmer. Because we had two degree bandwidth. Right? Barn has to be 70 for this fan to go fast with a 68 set point. Don't turn this one on. In this case, I had a half a degree, etc. This is how your barns function. 
So room temperature in the barn, once you think about it, is correlated with fan stage exactly. Part of doing chores is this. The other part of doing chores is looking at the inlets. Now, um, how do you know if the inlets, if you're walking barns every day, your inlets are adjusted correctly? Quick and dirty tool, and it works pretty damn close. Proper inlet velocity is 800 feet per minute. That equates to 0.05 static pressure. That will give you about a 10 foot throw from an inlet before air starts slowing down and coming down. For a five foot seven guy like me, that means on a finishing barn with eight foot ceilings, if I'm back 15 feet from the inlet, the airstream is hitting me in the forehead. Okay, quick and dirty. If you're back on an eight foot ceiling, if the inlet airstream, because you, you've been in a barn, you put your hand up, you can feel the airstream, and you can follow it. If it on five foot seven guy, 15 feet back from the inlet, it's hitting me in the forehead, my inlets are adjusted close enough. If it's not hitting me in the forehead, I've got something wrong with the inlets. And it's time to look. The other reason you look at inlets, especially these four-way inlets, that's a case of they'd been busted by the power washer, and now and they'd gone a whole turn of pigs with the inlet like this. That site was replacing roof steel. It's a curtain barn. So every time the curtains came down and released static pressure, where did all the hot air in the room go? Up to the inlet, condensed under the roof. And what's the roof steel look like underneath? Area like this. Above every inlet. You got to keep inlets tight, right? So part of doing chores is looking up. And, and looking at the inlet. Or these. There ain't no way that one will close. But we see a lot of them. The goal is that 800 to 1,000. That's where you get, just think, 15 feet in forehead. You'll be real close on inlet adjustment. Um, because while, while it's nice to measure it with the meter, if you're in the barn every day, you've got to have a quick and dirty trick. <laughs> okay? Uh, this one is interesting. That <laughs> There's an old bachelor who lives a half mile north of this site. <laughs> <laughs> and his house burned, and he's got junk everywhere, right? And the house burned. Where did all the mice go? The compost pile next to the hug barn a half mile away. <laughs> okay? But rodent control is part of daily chore routine. Do, do you do it? <laughs> I, I don't even have to look hard to find these pictures anymore. Part of doing chores includes all of this kind of activity. So, rodent maintenance of the rodent barrier is still a, a critical responsibility uh, on, on farms. Good enough never is. Hopefully in my discussion today, but focusing on things other than ABC pig, give this pig a shot, I've helped you go from being good enough to being better than average in pork production as part of your daily chore routine. So, um, I think all of you know it, but they didn't put it on screen. I do write a blog for Minnesota Pork Board. Usually every Friday or Saturday I put comments up and I ramble all over the world on pork production. mnpork.com.